Okay, thank you very much for the um, introduction. And as you pointed out, there are like a few caps uh, I'm wearing constantly. Yeah, and uh, as we pointed out, came from Germany and moved to Austria, so it's the German cap, the Austrian cap. Luciano said there's a South African cap. Then there's the cap of being a practitioner, another one, and the cap of being a professor, another one. So it's finally quite big hat. And uh, it's always a problem of figuring out what to talk about. But sometimes I think there are also some advantages because you've got the advantage of being inside a certain society and have the view from the outside at the same time, simultaneously, which is an incredible advantage, something I always try to make use of as a practitioner and as a teacher as well. When I came across the title, The Global Architect, I actually saw the question mark, the global architect. So I thought, oh, let's talk about the question mark. Is it questioning the global architect or the role of the global architect? Or is there something like a global architect? So I kind of sneaked in this subtitle, the local architect, just to try to think about that. And uh, I'll try to point out a few aspects uh, in, in referring to the local architect, maybe meaning this to be the global architect finally, and the way we deal with this in our world of um, architects or in our world of the products, uh, uh, projects being produced by my office. I'll show you five um, projects, and I'll try to run this topic through these uh, by, by explaining these. Um, projects. This is the medical university we're working on and half of it is, has been completed, just about has been completed in Graz. And a project we actually were able to win, not only due to its architectural layout, but due to the microclimatic conditions. Because the city of Graz is laid in a basin, topographical basin, and in, weather, in winter we have very bad weather conditions. So we need all the valleys to supply the city with fresh air. And this is the university will be is situated in one of these valleys. So making a big chunk of a building would mean to kind of block off the fresh air, especially in winter, and to um, worsen the air conditions in the city. So this is the first aspect of saying, okay, we've got the local knowledge of the microclimatic conditions in the city, which made us, you know, designing this general layout of the building, which in we know as architects our conditions of um, price efficiency and so on make, doesn't make sense because there is a massive increase in facades and facades in, in laboratory buildings is 25% of building cost. So it's a very expensive building. Every client would say, can you reduce the amount of facades, make one big box and we're done with it. But, so we've got the political issue at the same time which helps us along. <clears throat> then the, um, it's the University for um, Medicine, but only for bachelor students. So the bachelor students are students not working on patients, but they're trained in laboratories. So there's a very high degree of laboratories in this building. So it's highly specific, the layout. And uh, due to the um, expertise in our office, were able to work on this and also developed a new kind of laboratory um, where as a student or as even as a teacher you don't have to always change everything put on your glasses when you go into the lab but you can go around a second way and you just can be dressed as a normal person to check out in the laptop uh, the conditions of your research you've been doing. This is actually recoding the Austrian system because the Austrian system says you, every working space has to be attached to the facade. There's no other possibility. But these are now detached, and there were long discussions uh, that we are able to detach, detach these laboratories. First of all, we cannot open the window, but we need daylight conditions, so it took a long time of negotiating, and finally we were able to introduce this completely new system of labs uh, in this building. We've got a very high percentage of daylight, which helps us along to uh, decrease the um, energy we use for artificial lighting. And with the daylight system, we also have um, a very high stance in uh, facade technology of developing a facade, um, which can actually focus on the daylight qualities of different daylight qualities uh, in this building. Something we develop in our office, in the office ourselves, with people being trained there for many, many years. And uh, also working together with um, 
companies producing these facades, but also um, as a kind of win-win situation uh, with my own institute at the university, Architecture and Technology, we've got a research lab working just on facades, and we've, like, we've got two patents on facades. We won the European Prize for Sustainability and the, Austria, and the German Innovation uh, Prize for facades. So we are able to do these things in the office in Austria, which are not possible in Germany, for example. In Germany, this facade would be not possible, because in Germany, you don't have any structural en engineer working on facade systems. So all you can do in Germany is buy off the shelf or out of the catalog or you have to have a separate um, certification for a facade. So this is an incredible advantage we can use here, using our creativity and our technological know-how. <clears throat> Finally, this building is actually the first building in, um, in Europe, uh, which will be certified uh, by, by DHMB and OGNI and in terms of sustainability as a pilot project, because till now, you could only have like an office building or a school building or residential building, whatever, to be certified, but this is a mix. With other words, to say it in easy terms, if you have an office building, you put more insulation, you get more points. But if you put more insulation on a lab building, you get less points because you produce the energy inside the building. You have to get rid of the energy. So this is something they came across, said, OK, let's take this building as a pilot project for Europe. At the same time, we said, but why certify a building which is a public building, university building, it's not a real estate, it will not be sold, at least we don't think so, um, it won't gain any value, but now we notice, and the, the um, users told us, the university, that they are attracting um, researchers from all over the world, because it is known as a sustainable building heading for platinum. So they think it's the healthy atmosphere, they can do better research and comfortable and so on. So it's incredible what has been triggered off just by this very special certification. <clears throat> the staff working on this project, the, the core staff, are Austrians and Germans in, inside my office. Another project I'll take you now out of Austria is in Germany, in Berlin. A, one of the um, most interesting projects we know from the 70s by Werner Dittmann, it's a historical monument, a church um, and which a private uh, client bought four years ago. And uh, so you can rent the place for 99 years. It's in Kreuzberg. And we transformed it to a gallery. Now this project was stuck in a certain way because um, as it is a historical monument, um, the, the local um, authorities said, yes, we can change, we can continue building, but we have to accept the Charter of Venice. So you can continue working on a historical monument as long as you see the difference. And we said, this building is so fantastic, it's the most, it's best building this architect, Werner Dutmann, ever made in his life. We cannot do better. So we'll try to make it look as if it was Werner Dutmann, and only the architect will find out the difference. So it was stuck. And then we actually called in our Austrian people, speaking a different kind of German. Come to this later. And because in German, high German, there's, or in Germany, it says yes or no. In Austria, it says maybe, why not, kind of, all these things. But very seldom yes or no. And with this thing, we kind of got on in this discussion. I said, okay, let us do it in concrete, not in steel, because we have to add one floor, because we have to exceed the, the, the square meters in, for making the gallery. The, the um, authorities wanted it to be in steel, as a steel structure. We said it should be in concrete, so everybody would think it has always been there. But all the details are different just a little bit different. So the architect will notice something strange is going on here and then they will notice it's new. But the normal, normal person will never notice there would be any difference. And so finally we were able to build this whole thing. And um, 
and there was a hilarious discussion going on with the authorities about every detail all of a sudden. Not about the material, but the detail, the joint, and also just having this one slab, and this one slab has to be good enough for heating, it has to be uh, load-bearing, and it has to have all the electrical appliance in it, so it's incredible, just in 20 centimeters. But then they said, okay, if you put this in concrete, and not in steel, but one of these days it should be a church again, you have to take it out, so no foundations. Okay, another problem, no foundations. So the whole table which we put in here is without a foundation. You actually could, if you want to, carry it out one day. So it was more or less like the joint between the old and the new. As you see here, with this, this is the table now in, inserted in this, um, in this church and with a fantastic space on the upper floor um, for the gallery. It's the Gallery König, one of the most interesting galleries uh, at the moment in um, Berlin, perhaps some of you have been there already. People working on this project, German, Austrians, and Polish. Coming to Poland, another project. How to deal with a post-industrial site. This was a, oops, this was a, um, can we get that one back? This was a former coal mine. And uh, the Warszawa mine in, in, in Katowice, in Silesia, in the southern part of um, Poland, which is something like an industrial zone, the Ruhrgebiet, the Polish Ruhrgebiet, a conurbation of about three and a half million people. And Katowice is more or less the capital of this part with 300,000 inhabitants. And they got a lot of European funding to kind of re or to transform the industrial kind of heritage they have. So what we said as an interpretation of this uh, post-industrial landscape, uh, we can imagine to put this whole museum underground, which is completely stupid, of course, because politicians work on a project, work on a, on a competition, and then they want to finally open, inaugurate a museum. There has to be a building. So we said, if we don't make it on top of the ground, underground, we will never win because the politician will never be able to open this building. So, but so we said, there's a culture of underground. Work, people have always been working underground. There might be an understanding. And finally, we won this project as a competition. And everybody thought, well, we must be locals. Only the local would be able to interpret this site. He said, what we give them is a museum plus a public park, which they didn't have before, and just a few like skylights on top, uh, not knowing, or no, not showing what is actually um, below the ground. So the whole museum is on two floors underground, which is a very big area and storage area and so on. And uh, this project was only, we could only run because of a big part of our team being Polish. The mentality is so different. The way of running a project in Poland is different, although they're kind of neighbors. Just for as an example, when um, submitting the plans for the building permit, the Polish law says it has to be one book. And then we calculated the book, and we said the book is 90 centimeters. You can't read this book. And the book has to have that cardboard and that cardboard as a cover, and it has to go into the archive. So there was a negotiation of three months about this book, which you, nobody could read. And we found the solution of making the book 1A, 1B, and 1C, 30 centimeters. Also difficult to read, but somehow we managed uh, to get the building permit for this project. <clears throat> but then also going right into the technological details, again, of the facade technology. Um, how with a public tender can you actually work a project like this with all the local conditions given um, on site? And at the same time, our own attitude is saying, actually, we don't want to show this, these light boxes to be a museum, so you uh, kind of enhance the curiosity of um, people going along there and uh, to find out what is below. So there's a lot of detailing to be done, which is done by the staff trained in our office. And finally, we can then end up with a building with these glass panes, which are finally from Austria. Somebody who's got a patent on this and actually cannot control the process of making this glass. So it's unbelievable. And everybody thought we designed this floral kind of pattern because of the park, but we are not in control of the floral pattern. It's by coincidence. <clears throat> and we just like this thing of this very high technological aspect and the low-tech, non-controllable technology here 
on this uh, side, on this detail, as you can see, ending up like this. And the team working on this were Austrians, Polish, German, Romanian, Japanese, Hong Kong, Chinese. So a big team is growing all the time. Let's go into another project going into Asia, into Korea. Uh, we were asked to do a building Actually, our architecture is known to be very abstract and multi-layered. The use and utilization can always be multi-layered. And so we got this client and he said, well, I've got just a little bit of money, but um, every space which we have uh, should be, be able to be used in a different way. So the cafe can be an um, office, the car park can be an office, the terrace, rooftop terrace can be a camping site. This is a movie maker, and so they sometimes have 10 people, sometimes there are 40 people um, working in this space. <clears throat> and then with the, the, the thing which fascinates us with Korea is you know, near, near to Seoul is more or less the same climate, climatic conditions, more extreme, so the winter is colder and the summer is warmer. But the same thing of you know what to do with insulation, which kind of materials you need, uh, the technical performance is there. So we're working on kind of very similar basis. And with our partners, we started developing this project. Also then deciding which materials can you actually then use on site. And what does, um, for example, stone mean? Which uh, symbolic value does the stone have instead of render or instead of um, perforated metal or whatever sheeting you can use just to really put in this building and then finally um, they would ask uh, about the budget and they say is it a Korean project or a Chinese project because the Chinese is like 30% less they just have Chinese workers and then you have to rework your whole project again and to make it work fit for the Chinese workers on site and the staff here is again like Austrian Romanian and Korean working on um, this project to be able to make it finally work <clears throat> And ending up with a project we're working on um, at present, uh, an airport um, greenfield development in Rwanda in near Kigali at Bugusera. And uh, there's an international airport in Kigali at the moment, but the city has grown around the airport, so then you need a new airport, which is 30 kilometers outside um, the city. And uh, so we were asked to, to do not only the terminal building, but all the buildings. So there's just nothing there at the moment. And so there are like about 20 buildings we have to design in a very short um, period of time. And again, it was like our political move to say, okay, we can go into this, but we need our partners on site. Uh, we have to find out how can we build it? How can we construct uh, something like this? And find out all the parameters uh, which will make something work in a way which we think uh, would be very um, sustainable. <clears throat> so the airport layout is something which goes according to international conditions, ECAO regulations, everything can be calculated, you need the passengers per year, you need the peak hour, um, local conditions and so on. You've got the arrivals, the, the baggage claim area, you've got the departure, you've got the check-in counters, all these numbers, queue lengths, securities uh, can be calculated. Sometimes there are like strange remarks coming, we need five security uh, checkpoints. So we said we've got five, but next to each other they say no, behind each other because we don't trust, trust our own security people. But we said it's an international airport, it's only one, one queue here. <clears throat> so this is actually something which now I'm just focusing on the terminal building, not on the other buildings, which is um, kind of quite easy. The other thing is um, how to communicate. Um, for example, um, uh, plastic bags are prohibited in Rwanda. So there's a slight idea about green, green sustainability. Somebody told the president plastic bags are bad, so they're gone. So we said, okay, this is, might be just the thing to open the door. And let's try to make a sustainable, energy sufficient, self-sufficient airport. So this, now at the moment, the working title is like making a power plant with a runway. Because um, Kigali or Bugusera is laid on an altitude of 1,400 meters right on, next to the equator. It's tropical, but 1,400 meters high. So the runway itself is four kilometers, 4,000 meters, not 3,000 meters as usual. <clears throat> and we've got, say, um, warm temperatures during the day, but it cools off at night. So this is fantastic. So this was the starting point. We said, okay, let's 
see what we can do with this airport. We've got this huge site, which is already like five kilometers long by another 1.5 kilometers. So we can produce all the energy ourselves. We don't need anybody. We can make huge solar plants and then we can even sell off the energy to the neighboring villages and so on. So this can trigger off something. We've got our own water on site, so we can also do the water treatment on site. The sewage system can be on site. So we don't need anybody around us. <clears throat> and this is something which then actually called the attention of the, the government and said, okay, this sounds interesting, let's go for this. So now we, the thing about this airport is how far can we actually get? How much energy can we save? which goes up to the next point in saying, okay, all the buildings we try to have like big sun protection elements are uh, fixed, nothing is movable, nothing, uh, so it uh, doesn't need any maintenance, and we can actually reduce uh, radiation influence on the buildings so they don't heat up. On the one hand, so try to reduce air condition. On the other hand, try to introduce natural cross ventilation and then also to actually enhance the, the, the field of um, comfort, the comfort zone um, in the airport. So rethinking airports uh, is actually one of the substantial things we're doing on this project. And at the same time, uh, introducing local technology or using local technology, being, trying to find out can they be able to build it because this in, uh, airport we started planning last year but completion is due to um, December 2019 so they're under construction, it's under construction really, it's a really fast airport for 1.5 million passengers um, per year. But all the things being introduced here, can they really do it themselves and they, can they control it themselves on site and of course because you need large quantities. So it's about the facade technology, the breeze relay, the um, clay ceramics being introduced here with something they do themselves, but also the, um, the roof itself, which as an image is um, the interpretation um, or communicating the image of this thousand hills of Rwanda, so it's this wavy um, roof which looks interesting but is quite complicated um, to be made, but can all the seal structure be made? Can, for example, the downpipes be made in the columns because we know if you've got all the columns exactly where they would fix a downpipe if nobody is actually in control of that as in terms, say, of classical um, architecture as you can see here. So all the downpipes have to be in the columns <clears throat> and the columns should be prefab. The prefab can be made on site so they've got a, a prefab production plant which is, on, uh, which is there already. And next to this terminal we're working on a design manual for all the other buildings. Very simple system. So all the slabs are the same uh, thickness, all the columns are the same thickness, the grid is always the same, the briselay system, so system is the same except for the terminal building um, which you see here. <clears throat> and this is then it, something where what it might look because it looked like the thing we think is important for an airport. Airports change constantly. The only thing which never changes is the roof. And if you put the roof really high up, the roof will stay for a long time and they can always change the things on, on ground floor level or first floor level. Depends on the um, functionality inside uh, in the airport itself. <clears throat> the team we have here is Austrian, German, um, Romanian, Bosnian, Mongolian, Portuguese, and Rwandese. So it's a big team um, working here. <clears throat> How do we actually get these people? Where do we get the people in, in the office now? In, in comparison to Sneta with a small, very really small office with 40, 40, 50 people. Um, teaching at the University in Graz, we see we've got the, about the same numbers um, for foreign students and, and local students, 25%, something which I think is very important. Maybe we should get, get it to 30% or 35%. It's not only about attracting foreign students, no, it's, it's also attracting a different mentality. And this induces at the same time you have to teach in a different way. And it's a win-win situation coming up, which it takes more effort, of course, but it's something which is highly interesting and which also goes back into the office itself. <clears throat> 
And something we still have to work on is, of course, the ratio of women and, and men uh, in, in architecture. We notice in the master we're quite okay, but then finally they drop out. We've got the ratio in the office of 50%. I've got the ratio at the university of 50%. So this is actually the state where she should be handling things. What we do with the people, with the students in, or the, the young entrepreneurs coming to the office is I select the best students in studios, after studios, and I call them in for competition teams and to test them and train them and see how much they can actually take. Finally, uh, when they're more or less done or exhausted, they can still make a diploma with me and when we get a position free and open, they can come immediately. We sign a contract for two years. They have to stay in the office for two years for an additional training and they have to go through certain steps. And after two years, they have to be that far that they can be a project head. So the responsibility after two years is incredible. Of course, if somebody falls in love with somebody in New York, you say, okay, go because you start crying in my office for one year. Ciao, okay? But generally the people stick to this and after two years we've got really well-educated people. Finally, I think well-educated architect takes about 10 to 15 years and then you can really do very special work. And all the things like, maybe this is a little bit old school, the detailing as on a say, local and um, local level. <clears throat> what we do is, every fortnight we do a staff training of half a day, uh, training communication skills, training negotiation skills, training technology, everybody has to do some talks. But the basic thing we, we try to tell everybody in the office, respect the other. Even we've got the same language, the mentality is completely different. We cross the border. This is something so wonderful. And even though the moment you respect the other, then you see the qualities of the other, and then you can try um, to work with these qualities and make them your own. So it's the political thing which we have in the office, but also thinking of how do the others do it because architects are there all over the world. We are not the only ones to kind of save the world. Thank you very much.